Fourteen. Fourteen. Hold one twelve for the next one. Fourteen. And now back to 112. 112 is a different morning song than we're used to singing, uh, but it has a lovely melody, so I've asked Phyllis to play it with us. Please go ahead and start on the melody, and we can just sing it in unison until you're comfortable with the parts. 112 in Sing the Journey.
continue to prepare ourselves with worship with Pauline.
The Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and will bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel. On this snowy second Sunday of Advent, whether here in this space or joining by different forms of technology, welcome to College Mennonite Church as we gather to worship, watch, pray, and wonder. As we remember and awaken again to the gift of Emmanuel, God with us, that God comes to us in amazing and miraculous ways. Please join with me in the call to worship listed on the front of your bulletin. Awake, the invitation to carry light comes from the voice who cries out for a smooth way through wild places. How can we who are weak remove the rough and rugged places? Quiet our questioning souls. Lead us into your presence so all can see your way. Let it be so. Que así sea. Please join with me in prayer. God, we bring to you our praise. We give thanks for the music in the air, our voices and our bells raised to you. We hold before you our joy and entrust to you our sorrow. We are yours and made in your image. Open us to the movement of your spirit in and among us. Comfort us. Disturb us. Fill us with wisdom and loving action. Enlighten us. Ignite us. Open us to the hope you place before us. Continue your creating life-giving ways in and through us, through Jesus Christ. Amen. Please turn in your blue hymnals to number 176, Comfort, Comfort, O My People.
I clearly had a little more coffee than you all did this morning. Let's try 183 on Jordan's Banks, The Baptist Cry. As we enter into a time of prayer together, <clears throat> we remember Ruth Horsch as she will be undergoing spinal surgery this coming Wednesday at Cleveland Clinic. And Don Byler 
as he has been in the hospital for two weeks with very low blood counts. Art Smucker, as he has grown weaker and is receiving hospice care at Greencroft Healthcare. And we pray for Caleb Ganawan and his family and for his health. As we gather our hearts in prayer, we will begin by singing Oye Nos Mi Dios, number 358 in the blue hymnal, if you'd like to turn to that. And we will do this a few times throughout the prayer. Please enter into prayer with me. Lord God, we come before you today longing for your love, your peace, your hope to touch and transform us. We give you thanks for your mercy from generation to generation. We give you thanks that day to day, as we call out to you in praise or petition, that you hear us and you are present. Lord God, we pray for Goshen College students and other students as they enter finals week this week. Give clarity of thought and rest when needed. Encourage each one under the burden of the stress. Encourage that you are with each one. As the weather turns cold and white with snow, give strength and alertness to all those who travel. And for those who are struggling to heat their homes or even to find shelter in the cold, open up new avenues of provision and warmth. We ask you, O oh God, to lift up the lowly and the downtrodden to fill those who are hungry and thirsty. In this Advent and Christmas season, comfort and guide those who struggle with the pressures of the season, financially, emotionally, and spiritually. Comfort and encourage those who are in jail or prison and remind them of your abiding presence. Lord God, draw near to those who need care of their bodies, to those who long for healing. As Ruth Horsch prepares for surgery this week, prepare her in heart and mind and body. Guide all those who will be caring for her and give strength also to James and other family as they tend to her. Bring your encouragement to Don Byler and his wife, Pat, as Don is currently weak. Help him to gain in strength. Lord God, remind dear Caleb that he is not alone. His parents, siblings, and extended family are with him. We are with him. You are with him. Help his body. Give Martin and Chica your comfort and wisdom. 
Amen, God, as Art Smucker is growing in weakness, expand your love in and around him. Encourage and guide his wife, Carol, and his family as they abide with him and continue to make memories. For all those who are recovering from illness, injuries, surgeries, or other challenges of the body, we ask you to bring your comfort and encouragement. Speak with your still, small voice that sustains. Lord God, we pray for those both near and far who have been harmed by unwanted touch or attention. Soothe and bring your healing to bear on wounds caused by such behavior, by assaults on their bodies, minds, and hearts. Strengthen those who have spoken out and those who long to tell their stories. Lord God, enfold those who grieve, those who long for comfort and hope. We pray especially for those experiencing this first holiday season without a loved one. Grant comfort. Fill gray or darkened skies with your light. And God, we grieve alongside those who lost their lives trying to make for peace and safety for others in the De Democratic Republic of Congo. Comfort grieving fathers and mothers, sisters and brothers and friends. Lord God, draw near and strengthen those who long for and work for justice in many forms. Help our congregation, our community, and our nation to seek your justice. Let your justice inform decisions, guide actions, change hearts and minds. God, we pray for peace in Jerusalem, the West Bank and Gaza, and all the surrounding areas. We pray for peace in Honduras and many other aching parts of your world. Lord, we confess to you at times our lives become too full of pride or our need to be right and to be pure. Humble us, direct us, temper us, slow us down, stir us in your will. For those who are hungry for power and seek it at all costs, 
speak with your mighty voice, guide and direct those who need to be transformed by your love and drawn into the ways of peace. Let us, as Mary, trust fully in your mercy, in your holiness, in your strength. We pray all these things and more in the name of Emmanuel, Prince of Peace, I am Jesus. Amen. I invite you to turn in the purple sing the story to number 15, Hope is a Candle. And as we sing, children, you are invited to come forward to the circle. And we'll sing verses one and two this morning. you're here. It's been a long time since I've seen you. How are you doing? How are your families? Are we good? We're good. Well, I've been gone the last couple months. I was visiting my cousin, Elizabeth. You know Elizabeth, don't you? Do you know my cousin, Elizabeth? Did you hear? She's going to have a baby. She is so excited. And her husband's just speechless. <laughs> I, I don't even know where to begin. So much has happened in the last couple of months. It was a couple of months ago, and it was just, it was a normal day. I was doing what I normally do, when an angel appeared and spoke to me, the greetings. angel said, Greetings, favored one. God is with you. Uh, I was surprised. <laughs> Have any of you ever heard an angel speak to you before? Have any of you ever seen an angel? Well, this was my first angel, too. And I didn't know what was going on. And then the angel said more. Do not be afraid, Mary. God has chosen you to be the mother of Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of God. Uh, if I was surprised before, I was shocked now. I was going to be the mother of God's Son? How is that even possible? I'm not even married. But the angel said even more. God's Spirit will make it possible. Nothing is impossible with God. I was scared. I didn't know what all of this meant. How could I be the mother of God's son? What were people going to say when I told them I was going to have a baby and it was going to be God's son? What were my parents going to say? I could just hear the talk around town. I knew the gossip that was going to happen. What was Joseph going to say, the man that I was supposed to marry? What was he going to say when I told him that I was going to have a baby? I, know the story. I was scared. 
I was scared so much, I felt myself shaking. And at the same time, though, I felt like I was being asked to be a part of something that was so much bigger than just me. I felt like I was being asked to be a part of something that was so much bigger than I could ever understand. And so, even though I was scared, I heard myself saying, yes. Here I am, the servant of God. Let it be just as you have said. I still don't know what all of this means, even a couple of months later. I feel this baby growing inside of me. I feel this baby kicking and moving. And I wonder, what is this baby, what is this child going to mean for my life? What is the life of this child, this son of God, going to be like? How will this baby change the world? And I don't have the answer to any of those questions. But I do know this. I know that God is with me. The angel told me that. The angel said, God is with you. So when your time comes, when God speaks to you, or God's angels speak to you, I hope that you will remember me, Mary, and I hope you will say yes to I hope you will say, here I am, the servant of God. Let it be just as you have said. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you so much for your promise that you are with us always. In times of darkness, in those times that we're scared and we do not understand, you are with us. Help us to be brave like Mary and help us to listen for your voice so that when you speak to us, we are ready to say, yes, here I am, the servant of God. Let it be just as you have said. Amen. You guys might get your worship bags. Hi, Mommy. Number 180, the angel Gabriel, number 180. Phil Waite, our pastoral team leader, will be sharing our scripture passages and our message with us today. Please join with me in prayer. 
Gracious God, thank you for Phil's faithfulness in study, reflection, and prayer on your word. Open us each to hear and receive. Draw us near to you through his message today. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. We have two readings this morning. The first is from 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning with verse 8. But do not ignore this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some think of slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, and the elements will be dissolved with fire, and the earth and everything that is done on it will be disclosed. And from Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The word of the Lord. Almost 30 years ago, I began my term of service with Mennonite Central Committee in the Philippines, and I went to my first movie in the Philippines, uh, the cinema. And I was warned beforehand that you, you have to understand this, uh, my, my uh, fellow MCCers told me that when you go uh, to a movie in the Philippines, people will be coming and going throughout the entire movie. There'll be people walking in front of you, people, people getting up and leaving, and people coming in and sitting down. I said, well, why is that? And, and my friends would say, well, because uh, in the Philippines, people don't watch a movie from beginning to end. The movies loop through in the cinema, uh, continuously, and you show up at the cinema when you show up, and then you watch the rest of the movie, then you watch it from what we would call the beginning on to the place where you uh, came in, and then you would leave. Uh, and um, I heard that, I, I didn't believe it. I said, surely that can't be true. And uh, just the other day I was telling somebody about this, and they said to me the same thing, surely that can't be true. But it turns out it is true and was true. Then when I would go to the cinema in the Philippines, this is exactly what would happen. And when, when I would say to my Filipino friends, let's go see a movie. And they said, okay, let's go. Well, let's see what's on and what the starting times are. And they would say, starting times? What? Why should we care about that? I have uh, long thought about the significance of this fact. The, the fact that Filipinos will watch uh, movies in this way. There was, 
in those years, when I was in the Philippines, I, I can't remember who it was, but there was some kind of biblical scholar type person who came to the Philippines and heard about this and was concerned about the implications for, uh, for reading Scripture. How could you possibly make meaning out of Scripture? And how could you understand theology if you had no sense of what we would call in our Western tradition narrative and the way that narrative works? I remember, um, Mary Oy, are you uh, you're teaching music? And you, would, uh, and you would talk about music and the Western tradition, and I remember you doing this with your hands, and, and talk about the importance of tension, do this, tension, resolution, tension, resolution. And you, and you said, in Africa, music doesn't work that way. Music is not about tension, resolution. So when we tell a story in our culture, in our Western culture, sequence is very important. The order in which things happen and when they happen in time is, is uh, hugely significant. And we have in our culture grammatical tools to place things sequentially. Cause and effect. This happened, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened and how they're strung together and the order in which things happen is crucial to making sense, making meaning of the story. It's how we think. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. It's not Christ rose, then Christ died, and then Christ will come again. The order matters. It matters a great deal. I mean, who of us would want to read a mystery by by uh, reading the denouement or the, or the capture of the, of, the, of the bad guys at the end of the story, then read about the crime at the, uh, later. We, we, we want it to unfold. We want mystery. It's part of the joy of the experience and part of the meaning of the experience. So I, I have, honestly, I have stewed about this at different points in my life over the years. How, what, what, given the fact that so many millions of people, maybe billions of people in our world don't think about narrative, don't make meaning the way that I make meaning, what does this mean? What are the implications for how I think about Christian faith, which is so rooted for me in how I tell a story and the sequence of things and the order of things, brokenness, redemption, Fulfillment, beginning, and end. So I, I, like that scholar, biblical scholar, that went to the Philippines around the time that I was there, I, I've been troubled by this. And it's only been recently that I've come to appreciate the wisdom in that particular loop-de-loop -loop kind of understanding of a story. One of the aspects of our uh, biblical tradition, one of the things that, that, we, that we say, that we confess, is that God belongs to eternity. And the psalmists and the writers of the Bible have different ways to express it. And in 2 Peter uh, this morning, it's expressed in a particular kind of way. A thousand years are like a day, and a day is like a thousand years. Time does not work for God like it works for us. And as theologians over the years have thought about time and thought about who God is and thought about what it means to make eternity your home, as God does, they've come to the understanding that eternity is not so much infinity, um, but timelessness, as in not belonging to time at all in any kind of particular way. So we, can, we can do this with space. We're very, we're very good in thinking spatially about these things. So we can move in space. I can move this way, and I can move this way, and that. I can move, I can move different directions within space, right? Within the space-time continuum, I have a lot of freedom within space. I have limitations. I can only move so fast. Uh, and I won't demonstrate my limits 
uh, of speed, but trust me, I can only move so fast. I have limits in how fast I can move. But I can move in different ways, and I can jump up, and with uh, mechanical assistance, I can move really quite fast. Uh, um, with mechanical system, assistance, I've been known to go hundreds of miles an hour, not in the, in the air, not on the ground. Just make that clear. But in time, I can only move in one direction, right? I can only move from the present into the future. I can only move, uh, time only moves from beginning to end. That's the direction time moves. And the other thing about time is I can't speed up. I can't move faster through time on the space-time continuum. I can't move faster through time or slower in time. I'm stuck. I've got to move at a particular uh, speed in time, right? That's just the way it works. And I, I suppose it's possible to, the, the, the physicists have looked at this, and I suppose it's possible to speed up a little bit or maybe slow down a little bit. Uh, but mostly we're just kind of stuck in time. We cannot even imagine what it would be like to be able to slow down in time. I mean, how would it be if I could go slower in time than the rest of you? That would make for an interesting sermon, to say the least. But God is not concerned and not bound by time. Now, just try to, you're not going to be able to wrap your heads around this, because we can't. We're mortals. God is not bound by time. God is free to move in time as much as we are free to move in space, and more so. For God, if we can say, we seem to have relatively little, little trouble understanding the concept of everywhere, but we don't we, we, we struggle more with the concept of every when. God is every when just as much as God is everywhere. So even in this moment, what we experience is a given particular moment, God is in all moments. For God, this moment is the moment of the resurrection. This very, what, what we experience is this very moment for God is all moments and all times in all places. So my Filipino friends help me to understand that sequence might not be as important in understanding the gospel truth as I had thought. That in fact, to begin to comprehend God, even in the slightest, means being willing to give up a sense of time moving in a particular kind of way. Now, this is kind of hard work, isn't it? Mental hard work. Now, this is Advent. This is a the Advent season. And Advent season is about waiting, right? Waiting uh, patiently, biding our time, waiting for the Christ child to come into the world, waiting for God to break into the world. We wait. And we wait in hope. But I want to suggest something to us. I'm going to suggest that we don't wait. I want to suggest that literally for God, the future is now. The future is in this moment for God. We cannot see it, of course. We are bound in time, but for, for God, the future is now. And I want to suggest that every once in a while, maybe more than every once in a while, especially if we're trained to see it, that future, God's time, God's beyond time, breaks in to our particular moments. I'm going to tell a story, I mean, and, I, and I'm, I'm twisting it just a little bit to protect uh, the identities of people in the story. So I'm, I'm doing that, but, uh, but the story, I think, stands on its own. I was uh, traveling with some people uh, in an airport uh, several years ago, and we had checked in, 
And one, a member of our traveling party, was overcome with anxiety and despair. And there was no plan B. This person was stuck. I mean, literally stuck, standing still, looking out the window, unable to move. We had to go through security, a security line, uh, and the line was getting longer, and there was some anxiety uh, now on my part about whether we were going to make our flight. This was a worrisome situation. Uh, I had no idea what we were going to do if we missed that flight. We were going we were gonna, we were gonna to be stuck. We were going to be stranded. And out of nowhere, as if from out of the wall, a, a, a man appeared dressed as a, an airline employee, the uniform of an airline employee, um, like, a, like a baggage handler or, you know, he had one of those, those ear things that people put on to protect their ears. So I think he, he worked outside mostly. What he was doing at that particular time and that particular place, I don't know. But he said, you know, if you cross that street there, you can go through security um, where most of, most of the airline employees go through security and there's, no, there's never any waiting line. You can get through there. And he explained this again. It was a little confusing, but he explained it. And that was enough. It was an act of uh, simple gentleness and kindness, attentiveness, and care that was precisely, I mean precisely, what needed to be said for this person to overcome their anxiety and despair and to carry on with our journey. It was enough to take that person out of a stuckness, a moment of being stuck in time and being freed. And in that moment, uh, I believed, and I believe now, that that person was an angel. Of course, there are many ways to explain what happened there, I suppose. But the perfection of what he said, and when he said it, and when he appeared, um, makes me think he was an angel. Sent from the past, sent from the future, sent from beyond time. God's future, God's reality, God's time breaking into that moment. And I know as a pastor, pastors know that we all have many stories like this. And as an Advent discipline, I want to invite us to pay attention to those stories. Pay attention. Pay attention in those moments of despair, in those moments when you feel bound by time, God's time, God's future is coming and coming in. Amen. Thank you, Phil. Let's respond to Phil's words this morning with number 328, O oh God, our help in ages past. And if we could think of this song in a linear phrase, uh, we tend to do it measure at a time. Uh, and if we can think of it in a long line of phrases, I think the words will become meaningful to us.
Please take your bulletins for our confession and words of assurance. Join me. O God of blazing heavens, you come to us gently and tenderly, speaking peace and comfort into our fear. We long for you. We yearn for your promise of a new heaven and earth. Yet we confess that though we know how to get busy and prepare for this season, we do not know how to slow down or wait and make space for your presence. May our ordinary lives intersect with the power of your word and that transforming presence of your grace. Empower us to let it be so. O oh God, Emmanuel, in Jesus the Christ, you have come among us. You have given us life, and we are restored. Amen. I invite us to continue in our worship by sharing our tithes and offerings. You may come forward and place your offering in the basket or you may pass the off, uh, put your offering in the plate as the, uh, the ushers come by and pass the plates.
We're going to take a little bit of time now to uh, talk about the ICE Detention Center. How many of you have heard about the ICE Detention Center? It's gotten a lot of attention in the media, and I've asked Felipe Moreno, who is a member of our congregation and a lawyer here in the community, uh, to come and share a little bit with us about what it is, uh, why we should oppose it, and what we can do to stop it. So, Felipe. Thank you, Pastor. It's a blessing to be with you here this morning, and uh, unfortunately, under these circumstances. The Immigration Detention Center uh, that's being proposed now for Elkhart County is a facility that, would, uh, uh, that has changed uh, from the initial proposal to the plans that were proposed to the County Planning Commission recently. Uh, the facility, because it's a privately run facility, is not going to be having any of the safeguards that the government would have on any kind of uh, prison facility, because let's just call it that. They call it the ICE Detention Center. It's a prison. And it's going to be equipped for maximum facility, just like those things that you see in the movies, those ugly uh, buildings with barbed wire, two layers of barbed wire outside. Um, I have firsthand, I have seen firsthand uh, one of this this, this company, I've seen one of their jails down in, uh, in Georgia, south of Atlanta, in Lumpkin, Georgia, where people are treated inhumanely, the facilities are inferior, and uh, people are used, the immigrants are used for labor to compete against the local labor force at one dollar a day. Because you think about it, think about the IRS regulations, those of you that have businesses or those of you that are CPAs. What, what does uh, the IRS require? We have to disclose employees and file certain paperwork, right, if, if you pay more than a certain amount of money every year for an employee. Well, if you're at $1 times 365, it doesn't get to that threshold. So, so that's what they're paying people. And then when people get deported, they keep their money. This is one of the reasons why President Obama actually started canceling the contracts and closing down a lot of these private uh, facilities and, and was successful at almost shutting down all of them. Now when the new president came into office, the, stock, the stocks of these private facilities nearly tripled because they had a pretty good idea that they were going to be back in business. So ICE has not determined that Elkhart County is a facility where they're going to have a, a location, or a location where they're going to have a facility. However, this company, like its competitor, what they do is they go to communities like Elkhart County and they secure the contracts. They secure the land, they secure the zoning, so that then they can go to ICE and say, everything's taken care of in this community. You don't have to worry about anything. You give us the contract and we're ready to go. The reason why they want to locate here in Elkhart County is because a very little known fact that the Gary Airport is where the deportation flights go out of. And we're very close to Gary. Gary shut their project down, in case you don't know this. Uh, the, the Gary City Council decided and said, you know, and this was when they had 10% unemployment in Gary. They said, we might not have jobs. We might not have the tax revenue that we need right now, but we refuse to let you come in and destroy our community. So they did not allow them to go in. Hobart got together because that was, the, that was one of the places as well. The people in Hobart got together and said, we don't want this place here. So now we find ourselves at, at the crossroads where the plans have already been submitted to the Planning Commission. One of the things that people don't realize is that the Planning Commission doesn't approve or deny their plan. The Planning Commission for Elkhart County makes a recommendation or does not recommend the project. We need for this project to not be recommended because it will have many consequences on an economic development standpoint, on a humanitarian standpoint, it will affect all the progress that we've been making thus far here in Elkhart County. 
the reality is people don't want to talk about this, but a large segment of our labor force will not want to live in Elkhart County. And I can assure you of this, as 95% of my clients speak only Spanish. They will not want to live in Elkhart County, a place where ICE vehicles are coming in and out continuously. And we can't take that chance because right now we're at the point where we have a deficiency of about, depending on who you ask, 15 and 25,000 workers. And we need people to gravitate to Elkhart County. We need people to come here so that our industry can grow, become stronger, diversify. And we will not have the ability to do that. On the other side of this, we have, uh, so on the first part of it is, is the planning commission, which the meeting is coming up, I think it's the 11th or the 12th of January. We'll have those, those dates uh, set pretty soon here, or they're already set, but I don't know off the top of my head. That's a pretty much a land use decision. So, so keep that in mind. Planning commissioners are, are just really good people in our community that donate their time to be able to, to, to sit and listen to proposals of things that, that are consistent or are not consistent with certain zoning and certain areas. And in this particular area, the facility they want to locate would be near the uh, Elkhart County Jail, which the, the land, I believe, is zoned as a waste transfer site. So they would, there would have to be certain determinations that are made and certain findings. So it's really a, a land use issue at that point. Now after that, their recommendation or lack thereof would go to the county commissioners. Now that is where I think the bulk of our, bulk of our efforts should be. Because at the planning commission stage, I want to see uh, people at that planning commission meeting to support our cause, but my goal is to not overburden the planning commissioners. We want to have three or four key people get up and speak before the planning commission and to hit several points that, that are very um, important in terms of not approving this or not recommending it, and then possibly have people in the audience. The room only fits 150 people. I'm expecting more than 500 people there. So as many people we can get there as possible so that we can just say, if you agree with what this person just said, please stand up, that'd be great. So that way we don't have to repeat ourselves over and over again. But in terms of the planning commission, uh, in terms of the county commissioners, those are our elected officials. Some of you know those individuals. Mike Yoder, um, my brain is frozen right now. With, with who are the other folks? Do you remember off the top of your head? Help me out if you know. Susan Weirich. Susan Weirich. Lukasik. So, so those individuals are gonna make this decision, okay? So in the end, they will take into consideration every factor. They will take into consideration the humanitarian aspect of it, the economic development, the land use. They will look at what kind of a company it is, what kind of a track record and history it has, um, whether or not it's one of those companies where there have been uh, 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 prison rapes that have not been taken care of um, and, and different things that, that have happened at, at their facilities. All of those issues will be addressed uh, with the commissioner. So the planning commissioners, I would say, it's, it's not necessary and probably overkill, and we don't want to uh, overburden them right now at this juncture because we're going to have the land use arguments for them. But as of now, I would say if any of you has any influence or contact with any of the three commissioners, it's fair game that you express yourself with those commissioners because they need to hear your voice. It is extremely important. It means a lot to me, it means a lot to our community as a whole, and it means a lot to the future of Elkhart County. We're going to make, and we're gonna make it easy, easier maybe not easy, but easier. Uh, there'll be uh, people coming around during uh, our Sunday school time to the adult Sunday school classes with information sheets uh, that, that talk about 
the ICE Detention Center, what it is, uh, why we should oppose it, so some talking points, and some contact information for the, the people on the uh, Planning Commission and people who are county commissioners, so that you can contact them by phone or you can write them. We'll have note cards uh, also that you can, that you can, uh, you can write what you want to write to them, and, uh, and then we can send those. I invite us to turn to uh, number 16 in the, green, in the purple single storybooks, Peace Before Us. Let's stand, if you're able. If it would enhance your words by adding the motions to the physical space, uh, if that would help the hymn be meaningful to you, I invite you to do so. We go now with Christ's peace, Christ's love, light, before us, behind us, all around us. Alleluia. Amen. Amen. 